podcast. It's good to be with you once again. I want to thank Troy and David and Bill and Greg again for the work they're doing to make these broadcasts possible. And uh, it's it's good that we can do this, even though we can't be together. Um, my family wants to say hi to all of you and that we miss you. Um, today, my <clears throat> my dad is coming home from the hospital in just a few hours from the time that I'm recording this. And uh, we found out that, that he's going to be on hospice care from, from now on. Uh, the doctor has told us that they didn't think he had too long to live, so we're, we're sad about that. But he's lived a long life and can't ask for much more than 105 years. Uh, today we're going to continue our study of the book of First Peter, and we're going to cover verses 17 through 25 of chapter 1. So I invite you to follow along in your Bibles today as we read this, and then we'll go back, after we read the whole passage, we'll go back and look at the different uh, parts individually. Starting in verse 17, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Okay, let's go back to... Verse 17, if you address as father. Um, last week, we celebrated Father's Day, and we love our fathers and respect them, but we have a father who is much greater than all of our earthly fathers. And sometimes I think we're so familiar with calling God Father that we don't always realize what a fantastic and wonderful privilege it is to have the right to call God our Father. In 1 John 3, 1, John writes, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. It is a great honor to be a child of God, and uh, God's made that possible. And John 1, verses 11 through 13, tell us how this came to be. Speaking of Jesus, it said, He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, if we believe in Jesus, we are given the right to become children of God. And, it's, and uh, he creates us into a new being. That's what this uh, new birth that we've been studying about is all about. He creates us into new beings. And in that way, he becomes our father. And... I don't think we're going to fully appreciate how amazing it is until we see God on his throne in, in like one of those 
uh, pictures in the book of Revelation of God on the throne with the thousands upon thousands of people and angels surrounding him, praising him. And, and uh, at that moment, we're going to look at that incredible scene and the honor that's being given to God. And we're going to realize that he's our father. And he's not a distant father. The Bible teaches us that he knows the innermost thoughts of our hearts. He knows us better than our spouses know us or our parents know us. And uh, so we're going to have a close relationship with him. Uh, verse 17 continues on. The one who impartially judges according to each one's work. The definition of impartially, impartial, is not partial or biased, unprejudiced, fair. That's something that, that we're coming to grips with in America right now. There are a lot of people who feel that, that they have been treated unfairly, that there is a bias against them because of their race, because of the color of their skin. And, uh, and that's always going to be a problem on earth. But at least we have the comfort of knowing that in our relationship with God, he's not going to judge us by our looks. He's, he's going to look at our inner heart, and that's what he's going to make his judgment on. In some ways that's more frightening, but, but at least we're going to be judged fairly. Galatians 3 verses 26 through 29 tell us, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. It doesn't matter who we are, if, if we love God and obey God and, and become his, we can become his children, no matter what we look like, what, no matter, he, he talks about Jews and Greek, there's neither Jew nor Greek, so race doesn't matter to God. It says there's neither slave nor free man. So our social status or our economic status doesn't matter to God. It doesn't matter if we're poor, if we're the low man on the totem pole. In Christ, we are all equal. And there is neither male nor female. There's, there's been a lot of uh, struggle in our society over, over the treatment of the different sexes. And um, in, in God, everyone is equal. Although he has different roles for us on, in our earthly life, we're all equal and, and uh, equal children of his. 1 Samuel 16, 7 it, um, tells us about the time when Samuel was going to the house of David and choosing a king. And uh, all of the brothers were being brought before him. And, and some of them apparently looked very impressive and and Samuel thought they must be the one that's going to be king. But, but the Lord tells him, Do not look on his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Isn't that comforting to know that God's going to judge us on what's inside and not what on our outside. Okay, continuing in our reading, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. I think we don't really like the concept of fear, but that's a, an important part of our relationship with God. The, the Psalms tell us fear is the beginning of wisdom. Um, there needs to be an element of fear. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29 tell us, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, 
Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This paints God in a fearful light. He's a consuming fire, and, and we need to have reverence and awe for him and not take him lightly. Uh, but this this isn't talking about a, a hopeless terror. We're not so afraid of God that we have no hope because we're also told in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 15 through 16 that for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So although there needs to be an element of fear in our relationship with God, we can also have confidence if if we are in a relationship with Christ and, and have our faith in him and trust and, and obedience. Okay, he says we've been redeemed. What does it mean to be redeemed? Uh, Matthew twenty twenty eight says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and gave his life a ransom for many. So, a ransom. A ransom is something that you pay a kidnapper um, to for the release of of his victim. Uh, in a way, God is, or the Son of Man, paid the ransom to get us out of trouble. And Revelation five nine says, "Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue." and people and nation. We've been purchased. There's been a price that's been paid paid for us, and uh, we need to always be aware of that and thankful. And he says that that price that was paid was not perishable things like gold and silver. There's so many people that think gold and silver or money are, are the most important things in life. And, and all through history, people have struggled and fought and killed each other to, to gain uh, monetary gain, money or gold or silver. But, um, but we've been bought with something much better than, than, these, than these physical things which perish. And we've been bought to, to bring us out of this futile way of life that, that we were involved in before. Um, the things that people on earth spend their, times, their time looking for or working for is, is foolishness and futile in God's eyes. Um, Titus 3.3 3, I think, gives a pretty good explanation of this futile way of life. For, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Isn't this what we see on the news every night? politicians and criminals and um, all kinds of activities going on in the world that are related to malice and envy and hate and uh, the various lusts and pleasures that people are chasing after. Um, this, this isn't going to get you anywhere. It may bring you some temporary pleasures on earth, but he says it's futile. Some translations use the word empty. It's just a worthless way of life because there's no future in it. But we've been bought or ransomed from this futile way of life by the precious blood of Christ. That's, that's the precious gift that was given for us. Jesus himself said, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. 
And that's what Jesus did. He came to earth and laid down his life for us. And uh, so, so that should affect the way we view our Christian life. We need to take it seriously. Um, it wasn't a cheap price that was paid. It was a very valuable price. Okay, continuing in the passage. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. We've already looked in our first lesson on 1 Peter about God's foreknowledge. This explains it a little more. Uh, um, he foreknew Christ. And Ephesians 1 verse 4 tells us that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So this was God's plan from long before the earth was even created. And that's part of his foreknowledge. He knew that we would need this, and he loved us even before we came into existence. Okay, the, another sentence here. Who through him are believers in God? Jesus always pointed us to the Father. He, he came to reveal the Father, not just himself. And a, a good example of that is John 14, 6 through 11. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own initiative. But the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe in me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Look at the ways Jesus points us to the Father. He says he's the way to the Father, that no one comes to the Father except through him. And he also tells us that he shows us the Father. If we see him, we've seen the Father. We, we know what God is like. Through what, through what Jesus is like. Jesus is loving and um, came to help us, so we know that the Father is loving and that he's doing all he can to help us. <clears throat> okay, going back to the text. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. Okay, he's talking about us purifying our souls through obedience. Um, isn't it the case that God is the one purifying us and not our, we ourselves purifying ourselves? Well, even though it is God who is doing the purifying, we have a part in the process, an important part. We make a decision to be obedient, which leads to our being purified. Without our part in it, it wouldn't happen. Um, take the example of a man falling off a ship in the middle of the ocean. He's drowning, and a crewman sees him and grabs one of those life rings that are attached to a rope and throws it out to the man. Well, the man grabs onto the ring, and the crewman pulls him in. Um, who saved the man? Well, it was the crewman. He's the one that threw the life ring to him and pulled him back into the ship. But the man had a part in it too. If he hadn't have grabbed onto the life ring and held on for dear life, he wouldn't have been saved. And in the same way, we have a part in our purification and our salvation through our obedience. It, that makes it possible. God's not doing anything against our will. Uh, and this fits with Acts chapter 16, when uh, Saul came, or when Ananias came to Saul and told him, Now why do you delay? 
Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So he's telling Paul to wash away his sins. And even though it's God who removes our sin, Paul had a part in it by being obedient. And uh, so we're purifying our souls through obedience. Then he says, uh, you've purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. What does purifying our souls have to do with a sincere love for the brethren? Well, if we study the scriptures, we find that love for your brothers is very closely linked to, linked to being a Christian. Um, first of all, the spirit that we studied this earlier, how the spirit sanctifies us, the spirit helps us put to death the deeds of the body, and then it fills us with the good things. And a, a partial list of the deeds of the flesh mentioned in Galatians are enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. All of those things cause friction and hatred and fighting among men. Enmity means a deep-seated hatred. Uh, strife means fighting. Jealousy means you want what he has. Outbursts of anger. Um, you, you're out of control because you're so angry. And you do things that you wish you hadn't. Disputes, dissensions, factions. We see those all around us in the world. People fighting and disputing and envying one another. So all of those things cause us to have war or, or they cause us to have fighting among, among our brothers. But if, we, if the Spirit fills us with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all of those things lead to peace and harmony and, and caring among among our brethren. And uh, so if we have the Spirit living in us, that's we're going to love our brothers. And, and look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, and see how closely relate, related or closely linked this love for your brothers and sisters is to being a Christian. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. So, so loving the brethren is a sign that you've passed from this futile way of living into a life of, of, of eternity. He says, he who does not love abides in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. So he's saying that if you love your brethren, that's one way to know that you're in the truth. If you don't love your brethren, then you are not in the truth and you don't have the love of God within you. Okay, continuing in the text, you have been born again of seed that is, that is imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. We've talked a bit in, in past lessons about this concept of being born again. We're being created into new beings by the work of the Spirit. And it says that, um, that this happens through the living and enduring Word of God. And he calls that a seed. Well, that reminds us of the passage in uh, Matthew chapter 13, where he 
where he has the parable of the sower. And the, in the parable, the seed is the word of God. And uh, I'll just read the explanation Jesus gives of that parable. I won't read the whole parable. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. And the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And, and when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom was so, seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So, the seed that he's speaking about here is the word of God. And how successful it is depends upon the soil on which it falls. And our hearts are that soil. We want to have the kind of hearts that, that receive the seed and, and grows and becomes prosperous. And we need to pray for that, that, that we can become fruitful after hearing the word. Um, then the final part of this passage that we're studying today, it says, All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. <clears throat> Everything on this earth is going to come to an end. It's not going to last. Everything that's man-made or man-created is just temporary. And he's telling us that what's really going to last is this word. What this word of God does in your heart is, is going to last for eternity. And that's what we need to put our emphasis in this life is on obeying that word. Last week, I, I talked a bit about um, theological liberalism and how it teaches that, that this Bible is not the Word of God, that it's um, just man-made creation, different men having different ideas about what God was like, and that it's not binding on us in any way, any more than any other book. It's just different men's opinions. But as we looked at last week, this Bible, from front to back, claims to be the Word of God. And it is the Word of God, and we need to pay attention to it. And it's going to give us life. It's going to grow into eternal life. And uh, we're going to be talking about this millions of years after we've been in heaven. And be so thankful that God gave it to us. So don't. Don't fall for, for these schools of thought that tell you that this is not true. It, it is true, and it's the only way that we're going to have a relationship with God in the way that we need to. Well, that concludes our class for today. Next week, we'll start in chapter 2 of First Peter. And uh, I thank you for your attention. And let's, let's end with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we once again just thank you for all these blessings that you've listed in this book, in this letter that Peter wrote. We are so wonderfully blessed through your love and for your care. And we thank you so much for this word that you've given to us in the scriptures. 
and uh, we, we ask that you give us the strength we need to obey that word and to be faithful to you and uh, just continue to be with us in this coming week as we try to live the kind of lives you want us to live. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen.